Good morning, everybody. Um, so uh, it's everybody's, of course, favorite time of year getting to um, year end. And so we want to take this time to kind of give you guys an informative session on um, 1099s, what the form is, um, what the requirements are, and kind of show you guys also how to run reports. And um, we've got a session for QuickBooks Online, and we have a session for QuickBooks Desktop to kind of walk you through making sure that the information that you have in the system is correct so that when it's um, time to actually prepare the forms, that it's really easy. We've got the information um, minimal time, at, you know, in January when it's kind of crunch time for everybody. Um, so what we've done today is kind of thrown together a, um, you know, just quick overview of 1099s. Um, so Brendan, if you'll kind of switch then to the next slide, um, we'll go through um, at least some of the, we're going to do the baseline, the NEC and the miscellaneous, which are kind of the higher level, um, and we'll touch a little bit on the interest forms. Um, we'll show you a screen that has a lot of the, the other forms. There are tons of them. So there are specific, um, you know, things that we can look at, or if you've got questions related to specific things, we might need to either research or um, pull up information on that to make sure that we're assessing. But at least today, we'll give kind of the high level overview um, on the, the 1099 NEC and the 1099 miscellaneous. Um, so just as we kind of think about what the 1099 um, is, it is, of course, uh, the form that the IRS uses to help ensure that the expense that people uh, that you're paying matches up with income that is reported on um, another taxpayer's tax return. And so the IRS uses this, uh, what they call the information return program, to help ensure compliance, really. Um, so unfortunately, there's nothing exciting about filing the forms other than it truly is a compliance requirement. Um, so a couple of things to know, our filing is required um, if applicable thresholds are met. Um, some can be as low as $10 for um, items such as like dividends and interest in a few cases, or typically what we see on the miscellaneous and the NEC, uh, the requirements are about $600 as, as a minimum. Um, and we'll get to some of those requirements as well, but that is kind of the, the minimum that you would pay cumulatively throughout the year. So if you have uh, just one payment of 600 that would qualify, or if you have three payments of $200, that would qualify to meet that minimum as well. Um, deadlines are in place for filing um, all of these returns. And unfortunately, unlike some of the other business returns, these cannot be extended. Um, again, because the IRS is using these as for their matching, and they want these returns typically out by January 31st, so that when people start filing their tax returns, they can automatically do the matching to ensure that, that the income is being reported. Um, and then we'll talk to you about uh, penalties in a little bit, but there are penalties for late filing um, or filing of incorrect information. Um, tax ID numbers aren't necessarily the information that they're looking for where penalties would be assessed, but really, um, you know, frivolous amounts or non-filing is a big one. All right, so a couple of examples that we've got, again, we are we don't have time necessarily in today's webinar to touch base on everything, but a few of the ones that we want to make sure that you guys are aware are out there are listed here. We've got two pages of them um, with the acquisition and abandonment of secured property, um, proceeds from barter or exchange, um, cancellation of debt. So that's a big one that we have if you ever have any type of bankruptcy filing or um, you know creditor issues there. Uh, dividends and distributions, government payments, um, interest income, long-term care and accelerated death benefits, miscellaneous income. So as I alluded to earlier, the 1099 miscellaneous is the one um, that we'll touch base on as well as the next one, which is the 1099 NEC non-employee compensation. Um, for a few, well, not for a few years, for a long time, those two forms were actually combined and then about two years ago, the IRS um, specifically broke out the NEC from the miscellaneous to help with compliance and ensuring that people were reporting those correctly. Um, there's also an original issue discount, a taxable distrib distribution from um, a cooperative. There's payments from qualified education programs, distributions from pensions, annuities, and retirements. Um, so your IRA distributions, any of those, 
uh, proceeds from real estate transactions. So the easy way to remember that the 1099 S is for a sale. Um, the SA would be distributions from an HSA. Um, the social security tax statement, there's a special one, the RRB here we've listed for the um, US Railroad Retirement. Um, those are, again, not all of these are gonna apply to you guys. We just wanna make sure that you're aware of what they are. Um, there is the 1098, which is mortgage interest. Uh, the contributions for motor vehicles, boats and airplanes. So if you're ever donating those, um, those need to be issued. And then the 1098E student loan interest statement, uh, 1098T tuition statement, and 1095 is the last one listed, which is healthcare information. Um, again, all of these are what we refer to as the information return. So truly just the government, the IRS being able to ensure that information is being reported um, identically across entities. All right, so our focus today, and hopefully you guys are as excited as this lady is, but the 1099 NEC and the 1099 miscellaneous. Um, okay, so we'll just give you a few examples. And again, this is not the end all be all, but this is at least some um, general overhead information for you. But if you, you will issue 1099s for payments issued in the normal course of business. What that means essentially, if you issue it personally, that does not apply. So if you um, just pay me, you don't have a business, there's no need to issue a personal 1099. Um, it is truly just in the normal course of business. Um, payments not made to a corporation. So corporations are exempt from this. However, we always say that they're exempt. And then of course, some exceptions apply and we'll talk about some of those. Um, and then there's thresholds. So for example, at least $10 of royalty or interest um, and then $600 or more of rents, uh, prizes and awards are one of those that would qualify, um, medical and healthcare payments, crop insurance proceeds, gross um, proceeds paid to an attorney. Those would go on a 1099 miscellaneous. Um, and so just for your information on that one, we put, you know, example is a settlement agreement. Uh, the actual uh, fee that you pay to an attorney for their services will actually go on a 1099 NEC. But if it is part of a settlement agreement, it would go here on the miscellaneous. Um, the section 409A deferrals, non-qualified deferred compensation. Um, and then the form 1099 NEC is pretty um, just simple when you look at it. Truly, it is just for the services that are provided more than $600. And again, vendor is not a corporation. So if you paid me, but I'm a corporation and you could have paid me $100,000, but I would not qualify if I was a corporation. Um, and then here's just a couple of exceptions. So because of the like credit card and third party network transactions, i.e. a lot of like online payment um, platforms, they are required actually to issue what's called a 1099K. So if you have payments that are made by credit card, those will actually be reported through your credit card provider as opposed to you having to issue a 1099 for that payment. Um, you're not reporting scholarships or grant, uh, fellowship grants. Uh, employee business reimbursements do not qualify on here. Um, and then there's a full list. So we've um, included just at least a link so you can see some exceptions, um, you know, when you've got a little bit more time. All right. And then just to kind of give you guys too a quick overview of some examples, um, just in case it might spur a, oh yeah, we've got that. Oh yeah, we've got that. Um, professional fees to accountants. So I will tell you, um, well, it should be 100% of our business clients at least should have issued like Williams Keepers, for instance, a 1099 for our services. Um, attorneys, engineers, architects, and consultants. Um, fees paid by one professional to another, for example, the referral splitting. Um, any type of like commissions, fees to independent contractors. So for instance, landscaping companies, you know, painters, if they're not incorporated and they've provided a service, um, those would apply. Prizes and awards for services performed. Um, also another big one is fair market value of services exchanged between individuals. So um, sometimes it's not necessarily cash, it can be in other forms and that would still um, need to be reported on a 1099. Uh, director's fees would apply as well. Um, gross oil and gas payments, 
cash payments for fish. Although we laugh at this because this always pops up. I will tell you, I've personally never seen um, having to issue one of these, but of course we also don't have a large um, you know, fishing industry really close to us, but that would apply. Um, and then any person for whom there is backup withholding. And that one is regardless of the amount. Um, so just kind of as a note on that, the you can do um, backup withholding. So for instance, um, you know, some uh, contractors will actually want you to do backup withholding. It's kind of similar to withholding on payroll. Um, but that regardless, if you do any type of back, uh, backup withholding is required to be remitted on a 1099. Um, and then here, so we'll kind of talk about the why should I file. Um, it is a compliance requirement, of course, with the IRS. And so the biggest thing to remember is, is a reason why people file them is to avoid the penalties. Um, the IRS, of course, because they're trying to look out for the income, proper income reporting, um, is going to assess penalties on these. And so they have ranges from $50, and this is per form that is not filed, all the way up to $280 per form. Um, and so that fee, why it varies, it can increase depending on the length of time um, from the deadline. So in the next couple of slides, we'll look at, at deadlines um, and do a quick overview of those. But the longer you get from the deadline or um, and the next one, intentionally disregarding the requirements and not filing um, could actually put you in a situation where there's a minimum penalty here of $570 per form or 10% of the amount that would have should have been reported. And on that one, there is no maximum. So it can be quite a large number if you've got quite a few independent contractors. All right, so the next thing, the question comes to, how do I get the information? So if I determine that someone is subject to a 1099, how do I get that information? And the easiest way is to request from your vendor a copy of a W-9. So we've got a copy here. Um, I mean, you can just Google Form W-9. Uh, we can always provide one for you if you need it. Uh, but really, this is just a fillable form where they can fill in their name, their uh, business name, if it truly is a business, and then their um, their entity type, as well as address, tax ID, all of that. The biggest thing on here to look out for is if there is a name of the individual um, that you're going to be listing and they provide a social security number, then the social security number and name need to be what's reported as opposed to a business name with that. So we'll run into issues where we have what we call a tax ID matching, where if the IRS is looking up the number that was provided with the either the individual's name or the tax ID, they can't match an individual with a, a business tax ID or vice versa. So most important is to remember on the 1099 form, if it's a social security number, we need to make sure that the individual's name is actually being um, input and then will be presented on the 1099. All right, and then just a quick overview of filing deadlines. Um, so most important is, most important date is January 31st. As far as uh, for the NEC, the payee and the IRS um, need to have those forms or you need to have at least sent the form to the payee and then um, filed with the IRS by the 31st of January. And then the miscellaneous, the copies have to be out to the individuals by January 31st. But if you file by paper, um, it's February 28th, and this is to the IRS. And then if you file electronically to the IRS, it would be by March 31st. And then one last thing before we get into kind of the procedures to determine if you've got all the information is just talking through um, e-filing requirements. So. If you file or your entity files more than 250 information returns, um, then you are required to electronically transmit those. What that means is like um, when WK uh, transmits, we actually do all of ours electronically. But if you are preparing them and you have more than 250, then you are required um, to actually do it electronically. Um, so there is a separate system. If you're handling them on your own, um, we can always help you with that, kind of talk you through that. 
Or the other thing is just to know when it says 250 information returns, that is for each type of form. So for instance, if I have a 1099 NEC um, and then I have a form 1098, well, I might have 5,000 form 1098 and I would qualify there, but that doesn't necessarily mean I have to also electronically file 1099s. Um, so those are just some helpful bits of information um, before we kind of get into the process. Um, and actually, before we get in here, I want to just make a quick introduction. So um, I'm, I don't even think I introduced myself. I'm Megan Tolson, by the way, um, controller service manager, and handle a lot of the 1099 oversight. Um, and then on the call also today, we do have Brendan Burkhart, who will be presenting now, um, and then Bailey Edwards. So they're both um, CPAs, accountants with um, the firm, who also handle a lot of the 1099 questions, filing, um, the compilation of information, and uh, I'll turn it over to Brendan now. Thanks, Megan. <clears throat> so as Megan said, uh, to this point, we've been kind of giving you an overview of what 1099s are and how and when they should be processed and prepared. Um, so now we're going to take a look at how we take care of that in QuickBooks Online, as I'm sure many of you on the call this morning utilize QuickBooks Online for your day-to-day bookkeeping and accounting. Um, obviously, we recognize that there are a lot of many, there are a lot of features to QuickBooks Online, so we want to make sure that you're comfortable and familiar with how to get to these specific processes and um, tasks to make sure that everything is ready at your end for 1099 processing. So the first thing that we, of course, want to just make sure is review and verify that your company information in QuickBooks is reporting correctly, um, which we'll get to in a second. And before we go any further, just to give you kind of, kind of a big picture idea, the next 15 to 20 minutes or so are just going to be several screenshots that we're going to walk through together on how to get to certain places within your QuickBooks online uh, file as well as just overview certain things that we noticed, especially when we usually work on preparing 1099s at year end as what is most helpful for you guys um, to get the information you need, as well as make sure that your vendors, as well as the payments are tracked and set up correctly. So again, step one, review and verify that your company information is correct. Now there's two ways to kind of get here that we wanna point out to ensure that where the 1099 filing step is, um, there's a couple ways to get there. The first one would be um, on the left-hand side, you'll see your taxes bar, and then you'll hover over that, and then you'll have the option to choose between sales tax as well as 1099 filing. When you click on that, that'll take you to this screen here um, where it will ask you to get ready for your 1099 filing, it'll give you some information, and then continue to your 1099 with the green button, which I'm sure you're all familiar with the green buttons in QuickBooks Online. The other option would be to go to your expenses bar on the left-hand side, and then the third option down would be the vendors option. Once you select there, then you'll see you'll go to your vendor listing, which is a familiar screen, I'm sure. And over on the right-hand side, you'll see that there is a slight, there's a gray button that says um, prepare 1099s. And you can select that button, and that will get you to the same screen where it says get ready to file your 1099s for, for year end. You can hit the green, continue your 1099s. Once you hit that green, continue your 1099s um, button, you'll get to this screen, which is kind of the main section that we'll be working through today. Um, and you'll see that the first one is just simply reviewing your company, company information. Um, I will say that this is just a sample company, so the information provided here is just filler information. But as you'll see, the main information that we you'll need to have is your name and address the phone number for the business, as well as a tax ID for the business. Um, of course, if the company has been set up for a while, it's more than likely that this information should be correct, but it never hurts to just verify that it is, in fact, accurate. And if you need to adjust that information, you can notice on the right-hand side of the screen that there's just the pencil icon that you can go ahead and adjust as necessary. And you'll know that as well that it will save to your company settings if in fact there is something that's not quite right. The next step, of course, will be to categorize payments to 1099 vendors. And what we mean by that is ensuring that the vendors that are supposed to be receiving 1099s at the end of the year 
are set up in QuickBooks Online to make sure that QuickBooks knows that they are um, a 1099 vendor. So there's a couple steps to this, couple things to this step. First will be to categorize um, the payments to the contractors or to the 1099 vendors. And this, this screen might look uh, new to several of you, which is why we wanted to take the time to make sure that um, you know what to expect here and how to go about using it. Um, so the first thing that you'll want to do is you'll notice that um, on this list, you'll see that the first uh, is common pay payment types, which as Megan alluded to earlier, are the main, the two big ones are going to be the 1099 non-employment employee compensation, as well as um, rents, which is going to be your 1099 miscellaneous. And then you'll see below that there's a direct sales section as well as other payment types. Um, and then you'll see, just to flip to the next slide, you'll see that there's also the various options that have been overviewed previously of specific things that might apply um, to your business. Again, as Megan alluded to, the, most, the majority of these are probably going to be non-employee compensation. And then there may be, there probably will be a handful of you that will utilize the 1099 miscellaneous um, for rent, royalty, other income, possibly medical payments, things like that. The, so the first thing that you'll do here is if, if a 1099 NEC needs to be um, issued, you'll go ahead and select that first box under common payment types, um, non-employee compensation. In this case, the example I'm providing, you'll, I have both non-employee compensation checked as well as rents selected. And you know, you'll notice from the previous slide, currently there's no dropdown um, available. But then once we select them, you'll notice that there is a drop-down box below it, and it allows you to, there's an arrow next to it, and it tells you to choose an account. This is where you, on your end, will go through, and you will go through your chart of accounts and essentially map the chart of accounts to pick up any um, accounts that you know that will need to be for non-employee compensation. So the best example that we have is any accounting fees that you have um, paid throughout the year to say us as Williams Keepers. Um, other examples, of course, would include any legal services, um, subcontractors, janitorial services, um, things like that. So in this case, we're mapping the accounting um, general ledger account or the chart of account to ensure that when we get to the next screen, it's picking up those accounts. You also have the opportunity here to select multiple accounts at once. So you'll see that previously the accounting um, expense account was selected. And then here we're also selecting the lawyer, legal and professional fees. Um, and then for this sample company, those are the main three, but of course in subcontractors, janitorial expenses, um, even certain IT expenses, you can select each of these accounts and then it will map um, each of those vendors to ensure that they're picking up the 1099 payments. Once you've done going, once you've completed going through each of your um, chart of accounts and just verifying which accounts you think should apply to these non-employee compensation or in the other case rent, you'll probably select the rent account, rent expense account. Um, you can hit the green next button. Which brings me to step three, where we'll review and verify vendor addresses, tax IDs, and then also ensure that 1099 tracking is set up within the vendor. So once we've completed mapping our accounts, the next step that will take us to is to this screen where we'll review our contractor's information, which is essentially the 10, those vendors that we believe should receive a 1099. And you'll see here that it provides both the contract name, the contractor name or the vendor name, the current address that you have um, within QuickBooks Online, and then the appropriate tax ID. And then you'll notice too that there's both an email section, um, which is not necessarily required for 1099s, but then there's also an action button where you can um, edit as necessary. Again, you'll notice that the tax ID section for this example is just um, plugged to numbers, but here's where you'll, if, it, if a tax ID is currently not set up within QuickBooks Online, it will likely flag it that you're missing the tax ID. And that's where on the right-hand side under the action column, um, you can choose edit here, and that will allow you to um, manipulate as well as update or verify the existing information to make sure some of it is correct. Um, or there's the option to go out of the screen and go into your expenses, individual vendor account. 
um, which we'll show here in a second. So if you believe that a specific vendor is not showing through on this screen and you believe um, that they should be, say, for example, at Williams Keepers, you know you've paid over $600 for the year um, and you know in years past you've prepared a 1099 for us Williams Keepers, then you could go over to the right-hand side and add from vendor list and select that button to do so. When you select that screen, you'll get this um, kind of this pop-up on the right-hand side, and here is where you'll be able to search um, by your vendor if you um, suppose that one of them should be there. But you also notice that Jenny Robertson, for example, Robertson and Associates, um, has been selected, and you notice that that's already on the existing screen. But then if you go ahead and start um, searching Williams Keepers, then you'll see that, in fact, they are our vendor already in um, the QuickBooks online expense side. And then when you select them and hit save, you'll notice that then they will populate on um, the screen that we were just at. You'll notice, however, that there is um, some information missing. In this case, it was a vendor or company name missing and it flagged it, um, which means we probably need to go back into the individual profile and update some information specifically. To do that, of course, um, you'd go out of the screen that we were just on. So I would recommend you could hit save and finish for later. You'll keep everything where it's at currently, and then it will take you back to the main screen that you're familiar with. On the left-hand side of the screen, you can go to expenses and then go to your vendors, which will take you to your vendor listing. Um, and I skipped over it, but I just searched over uh, where Williams Keepers is, which took me to their main page. Once you get to the individual vendor that you're looking for or that you're knowing needs to, information needs to be updated, of course, you'll go to the top right-hand side of the screen um, where the edit button is and you can select that. Once that is selected, it will obviously pull up the vendor information where you get to input any information that is pertinent. So obviously the big things would be the company name, um, the vendor name, um, and then down below would be the street address, verifying that that is truly, in fact, their current address, including both the city and state, and then a zip code. Down below, this is where the probably the most important thing that we would encourage you to keep in mind as you're going through your vendors, especially um, from here till the end of the year and even going forward, um, is this business this taxes section, additional information taxes section, where it allows you to input um, their business ID, their tax ID, or their social security number in the case that it's an individual. And then to the right, you'll notice that there is that little checkbox that says track payment for 1099. Um, this, is the, this is the key to ensuring that, this, um, that vendors are pulling through into that earlier screen that we were looking at for contractors information. Um, you may, Williams Keepers may in fact be a 1099 recipient. You may have their business ID in their um, profile, but unless this box is selected that Williams Keepers will not come through on that contractor's information list. So it's important that you have both the business or social security number, as well as ensuring that this track payments for 1099 is selected. Once you've entered both of that information, verified that all the vendor information is correct and up to date, you can hit save the green save button down um, in the bottom right corner. So once you've gone through and you uh, recognize there are certain maybe possible vendors that aren't coming through on that section, um, you would go through each of those vendors that you think would be um, applicable for 1099s, which it's our recommendation, probably the easiest thing to do is to go back to your 2021 1099s that, that were issued that whether uh, you prepared in-house or that we prepared for you and start with those and ensure that those are properly set up within QuickBooks. Um, those would be the easiest ones to get started with. And then of course, if there's any that maybe you are new subcontractors for the year, or possibly if you're new to WK this year and you have yet to um, issue a 1099 to Williams Keepers, then um, you could follow these steps that we're going through and just make sure that all the information is there and that track payments are set up. So once that is done, then it's step four, and we're fine, a final review of vendor information, which might sound repetitive, but it's important that we ensure that the information is in fact correct before we go ahead and prepare and process the 1099s for year end. 
So again, this is where um, I would re return to the 1099 screen, 1099 filing screen, which is where we were a little while ago. And you'll now see that Williams Keepers comes through and there's no more red um, error message or note saying that information is missing. So in this case, this sample company only has three possible uh, 1099 there are possible vendors that are tracked for 1099 purposes. Um, for some of your businesses, you might be in a very similar state where there's only a couple, um, as opposed to others of you may have 15 to 20 or even more than that. Um, so it really just depends on your business and what kind of services that you're paying for throughout the year. So once you've done a final review of all the vendor information, making sure that the name is in fact correct, which as Megan mentioned earlier, um, if the W-9 represents, or if the W-9 reports a social security number, you'll want to make sure that the contractor name is in fact the individual and not the business, and vice versa. If it's a tax ID for businesses, then you'll want to make sure that it's the true business name that's listed in QuickBooks, making sure that the address is correct, things like that. Once you've done that, you can hit the green next button, which will take us to the next screen. And here is where it will finally pull through the pay total payments that have been made to these 1099 contractors or vendors throughout the year. Now, probably the first thing you'll notice is that only two of the three vendors from the last screen um, came through. So let me flip back to the screen and you'll notice that there's an insurance agency, Williams Keepers, and then Robertson and Associates. When I go to the next screen, you'll notice that there's only two, the Robertson and Associates as, and Williams Keepers. This is because QuickBooks has identified that only Robertson and, and Associates and Williams Keepers has met the threshold of the $600 for 1099 NAC reporting, which means that the insurance agency for the year likely did not reach that, um, or it certainly did not meet the $600 um, threshold. So it's possible that you could have a similar case where you have maybe on the prior screen, you have maybe 15 vendors that are being tracked for 1099 purposes, but then when you get to the total payments for the year, maybe only 11 of the 15 come through um, just because you've not reached the $600 threshold. And you'll notice here, um, this would be also the perfect time to verify that this is in fact the, the amount that you've paid certain vendors throughout the year. So if you look at Williams Keepers line, for example, and say, well, $4,000 seems a little low, then you might go back and make sure that, okay, was the, the bills that we've received from Williams Keepers recorded properly to um, accounting services or um, accounting fees, um, the accounting expense account, or did one of the bills by chance get put to a different account? If that is in fact the case, you can of course go back, um, you can hit save and finish later, go back to the individual um, vendor account, review the, the bills and expenses that have been um, recorded so far in 2022 and verify that they are in fact recorded properly. Um, and if you find out that, oh, I missed mapping an account correctly, then you can go back to that previous step, step two, where we looked at categorizing specific payments to vendors. So if you realize halfway through that, oh, I am not including my attorney fees throughout my legal fees throughout the year, but I have Williams Keepers, then you'd go back and ensure that legal fees is included for the 1099 um, NEC reporting. So once you've verified that that is all correct, um, up in the right hand corner of the screen, you'll see that there is a print information sheet. Um, and this is really the, the final summary step that you will go to when, you, when you're sure that everything is there for year end. I mean, once you click that screen, it will take you, um, it will take you to a new tab um, and allow you to review it one more time. Honestly, it's not the greatest of um, screens to review. It has a lot of information kind of all uh, jumbled together, but it does give a summary of how many 1099 NECs you'll have for the year as well as how many 1099 miscellaneouses, and then it will give a nice summary of the individual contractor or vendor information, their addresses, their tax IDs, as well as the payment amount that needs to be reported um, on that information. So once you've done all that, the final thing is to let us know that your file is ready for 1099 processing. Um, so we'd recommend, um, it would be really helpful for us if you get to that 
previous screen and you print out that information sheet um, or you save it to your computer and then when you send us the email to let us know that your file is in fact ready to go and you've taken the time and reviewed the 1099s um, that you think are appropriate for the for year end um, then that will give us the green light to go ahead and um, go ahead and start processing your your 1099s um, of course with reviewing 1099 NECs miscellaneous there's probably there may be certain situations where you're unsure if in fact they are um, 1099 eligible um, again feel free to reach out to any of us um, Megan, myself, um, Bailey's also on this call, or even your other uh, WK advisor or um, individual that you work alongside with, and we'd be happy to help answer any questions for you. And then, um, of course, if you have any issues as we get throughout, um, if you come to realize getting through the 1099 in QuickBooks Online um, and you're just unsure if they are um, truly a 1099, feel free to just shoot us a quick email. And we'd be happy to help you uh, determine if they are in fact um, 1099 eligible. And again, to go back to when Megan was presenting, the key is to ensuring that you have an up-to-date uh, W9 on hand, um, as that's going to be really the guiding principle for both you and us to determine: okay, is this per individual uh, or is this business a corporation? And if they are a corporation, then you probably don't have to file a 1099 in most situations. But um, if they are a sole proprietorship or just an individual, then it's more than likely that if they've hit the threshold of $600, then yes, in fact, um, we will probably have um, to prepare a 1099. So that's a lot of information in uh, just a short period of time. Um, it's a high level overview, um, but we just wanted to kind of give you a step by step process of how this works within QuickBooks Online. Um, we know many of our clients are transitioning to QuickBooks Online, um, so there's features within it that are just unknown and maybe different than what you're used to, whether you're previously in QuickBooks Desktop um, or you're just a brand new business owner altogether. So we wanted to make uh, take the time today just to make sure that you were at least aware of this. Um, and of course, we um, are glad to help you with any questions both um, today um, as well as throughout the next several weeks as we look forward to the end of 2022 and look forward to a busy month of January getting your 1099s out the door and prepared. Um, and so kind of back to, I, I completely forgot with my job at the beginning is to make sure that you're aware that there is a um, chat feature at the bottom of your screen that if you have any questions, that you're more than welcome to throw that in the chat feature. Um, as you can see, we've provided our email addresses if you need a screenshot of that for any follow-up questions, um, but otherwise the chat's available and reach out to us. Um, but a couple of just kind of also uh, helpful tips that um, we just also want to share too, and Brendan or Bailey with, um, you know, the amount that you've prepared as well. If you've got any that you think of too, it'd be great. But um, first thing is just making sure that your bank accounts are up to date, because if your bank accounts and all of the checks that you've written are not up to date, then, you know, you could be missing some of the transactions. Let's say you've only got it through November, then you could be missing, you know, December transactions, et cetera. Um, so we do have some clients that come in in a scurry of, oh my gosh, I don't even have my financials together. So um, it makes 1099 reporting extremely hard. So that's something as you're kind of getting closer to year end to really be cognizant of, be thinking of, um, again, if you need help with any of that, let us know. But otherwise, that's just one thing to make sure that we've got taken care of. Um, and then the other thing is, let's just say that you, you know, sometimes people are in a situation where you've either just started your business and so you hadn't been tracking these from the beginning or you have been given a file and you know that there maybe are more out there and you're kind of looking for where would I start in order to figure out, um, you know, who are my 1099 vendors? Um, the most common thing that we actually do whenever we're searching for this information is truly look at your income statement and search for a couple of the fields that would apply. So in particular, ones for contract labor um, professional fees and rent. 
So most of the time under, uh, because those are going to be where a lot of your services that are over um, $600 are going to fall within your contract labor and your professional services. So that would apply for the 1099 NEC. And then rent, um, if you've got a rent category on your income statement, those payments are going to apply as well and need to be reported then on a 1099 miscellaneous. Um, Brendan or Bailey, any other questions or comments um, or helpful hints that you guys have? Yeah, I did actually have a couple notes that I um, was going to throw out there. Um, so number one, I know that with the electronic payments or like the credit card payments that you mentioned, um, they are not necessarily have to file a 1099 because like the credit card company does take care of that. I know there have been some changes in the past couple of years with like Venmo and PayPal where they do issue um, the 1099 for you as well. However, um, I know a lot of small businesses, sole proprietorships, they don't use Venmo for business or PayPal for business. They're still kind of running off their personal one. And I don't believe PayPal or Venmo will issue the 1099s for you if it's on your personal one, because as Megan said at the beginning, for personal stuff, you're not issuing 1099s. It's only in the course of business. So that's just something to keep in mind if you are paying vendors through that, that you might want to pull your PayPal statement, your Venmo statement, and just review that to make sure you're not missing anything. Um, and then the only other thing I was going to throw out there is with your W-9s, when you're collecting those from vendors, you can actually attach those within QuickBooks to the vendor on that edit vendor screen that Brendan showed us earlier where you're putting in the tax ID. There's an attachment section and you can actually just upload the W-9 right there. That makes sure you have it. Um, it's there in case you ever need to refer back to it. It's just a good place to kind of store it rather than, you know, just saving it to a file on your desktop or something where it might get lost. Um, just, you know, a couple little QuickBooks tips. Um, and then one more, if you are, uh, if you're using your bank feed, especially when it comes to writing checks and Megan, correct me if I'm wrong here, but with payments to vendors, when you're cutting a check, it, you are going to go off of when you issued that check, not when that check is cashed. So just be careful when it comes to like the end of the year, if you're cutting a check to a vendor in December, but it's hitting your bank feed in January and you're not recording it until it hits your bank feed in January, that actually needs to be included with the December, the prior year's income when you're issuing their 1099 for the determining whether or not they hit the threshold and just what amount that 1099 is going to be issued for. Yep, I would agree with that. Um, Brendan, anything else to add? Otherwise, I'm not necessarily seeing any questions. Um, Brendan, do you have anything? I don't think so, though. The other, uh, just to highlight, again, if if this is brand new to several of you or many of you, then I would um, recommend going back to seeing what your 2021 uh, 1099s were that were issued and then start with those because those will be the easiest ones to get um, matched into QuickBooks. Um, to just verify that the data, you can see kind of what, if you take in just overview and what we've done today, you can enter that information and then that information is there for you. And those are the easy ones to knock out. And then if you have any new new vendors to figure out over the next several weeks, um, then you at least know that you have the ones that are reoccurring 1099s or the ones that had last year that you know for a fact are going to be, um, need to be issued again um, for next this coming year. All right. Well, thank you guys for joining us today. Um, I know as we've said about 18 times, feel free to reach out with any questions. Um, and we look forward to working with you guys with 1099s um, towards the end of the year and into January. Have a great day. Thank you.